Um, senior cardiovascular pharmacist um, for South East London, and we are hoping that she'll be joined by her colleague Helen Williams, um, who is the consultant pharmacist for CVD for South East London. Um, we will be recording this session, so I hope that by being here you are agreeing to that. Um, and we'll be using Mentimeter, so if you've just joined, you might like to download the app and um, enter the codes that are in the chat so that we can be very interactive through this. Um, I'd request that you all turn off and that you all go on to mute. Um, and we're going to be having three case studies. And at the end of each case study, there will be a time to ask questions. So again, we want it to be very interactive. And so there'll be points throughout the hour where we'll be able to stop and ask, you know, um, raise questions and, and issues as, as, as appropriate. Um, at the end, after this, we'll be sending out um, the CPD certificates. And also I'd like to um, raise that we've got um, another interactive um, session on the 30th of September at 1.30 to 2.30, which is on managing valve disease in primary care and interpreting echocardiograms. So if you're interested in that, we'd, we'd love to see you there as well. Uh, so without much further ado, I will pass over to Helen. Uh, sorry, over to Rachel. Thank you. Thank you very much, sally -Ann, and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, can everyone see this? Uh, we're going to talk about medicines optimization in cardiovascular patients, and um, I'm hoping that Helen's going to join us as well at some point today. Um, we're going to talk about three patients. Um, one patient has heart failure, one has AF, and one has ACS. And we're going to use Mentimeter throughout the um, presentation so that we can hopefully make this interactive and keep everyone interested. So um, the first case is a patient called George, who is 70 years old and he has heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. His um, left ventricular ejection fraction is 35%. He's had a history of MI, um, he has type 2 diabetes and he has hypertension. He lives with his wife, he's retired, um, but he really enjoys playing golf and he regularly performs 18 rolls, 18 whole rounds. Um, when we see him, his blood pressure is 155 over 90, his pulse is 70, but it's regular. Um, symptoms of heart failure, um, class 2, a slight decline in the last six months. And what he's noticed is when he's playing golf, he's getting more short of breath. He doesn't have any peripheral edema, he doesn't have any orthopnea, um, and his chest is clear with no chest pain on presentation. So he's come to us for a review. So have a think about some of the symptoms that we've talked about that may show that he has worsening heart failure. I'll just open the voting. See if you can enter your answers now. Oh, great, we've got an answer, thank you. Brilliant, we've got three answers, four answers. That's great. Any more? OK, I'm going to close the voting. And can you all can you all see this? Can you all see the results? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I can't see any of you. So um, we had um, three answers of short of breath when plays golf. That's excellent. That's exactly what the patient told us. Um, he doesn't actually have any um, signs of peripheral edema that would concern us and might make, make us think about his diuretic dosing. He doesn't have chest pain, which is great because that's not that's a red flag for heart failure. Um, and um, so, yeah, so ne the next steps would be looking at his medicines. Um, George takes enalapril, which is an ACE inhibitor, 10 milligrams twice a day. He takes beta blocker, 5 milligrams daily. He takes furosemide, 40 milligrams each morning. He takes aspirin. He takes atorvastatin, amlodipine and metformin. He has quite normal bloods, um, nothing really to, to be concerned about there. What could we do next? So could we increase his diuretic dose to 80 milligrams a day? Should we be increasing his ACE inhibitor? Should we be increasing his beta blocker? Should we be doing all of those things at the same time or should we do nothing? 
see what you think. Oh, we've got one answer, a very quick answer. Well done. Got four answers in. Five answers. Oh, seven answers in. Got a bit more time if, if anyone else wants to answer. <laughs> OK, I'm going to close the voting. Thank you for your answers. Can you see the results? Uh, we have two people saying to increase the diuretic dose, two saying increase the ACE inhibitor, three increase the beta blocker, and one saying all of the above at the same time. That must be a cardiologist. Um, and no one saying no actions. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for not saying that. Um, so with this patient, um, Let's think about the diuretics. So when you're looking at diuretic dosing, um, there's a really um, great um, guideline that we have in South East London for heart failure. And some of the one of the pages in the guidance talks about diuretics and when you should be increasing or reducing the dosing. So things to look out for in your patients um, that may need an increase in dose is if they are fluid overloaded. So they may have um, increased weight, they may have increased um, symptoms of heart failure, so really short of breath, um, swollen um, ankles, having more pillows to sleep with at night time, waking up short of breath. In these patients, you might want to think about increasing their um, diuretic dose, but of course, keeping an eye on their sodium and potassium levels. Another thing to consider is, is the dose of diuretic too high for your patient? So are they showing any signs of dehydration? So um, have they had some weight loss over the last few days? Um, are they not saying they're short of breath? Um, do they not show signs of edema? And are they saying they actually feel quite thirsty, they feel quite dizzy um, and feeling a bit tired and washed out? Um, might be that we need to have a look at decreasing the diuretic dose. So in this patient, we potentially don't really need to touch the diuretics at the moment. Um, I think 40 milligrams of fruits might, might be OK for this patient. So the next thing to think about is how do we optimise um, his medicines? So in patients with um, ejection fractions of less than 40 percent, um, the first line um, agents are ACE inhibitors or um, ARBs um, and then beta blockers. And what you need to do when you start these medicines is to try and increase the doses over time to the maximum tolerated doses. So these medicines all have maximum doses, but each in each patient is very individual in their response and their toler tolerated dosing. So it might be that some patients can only get up to five milligrams of Ramapril and some patients can go to the full dosing. So it's just a matter of, of um, following up these patients as regularly as you can to make sure they're tolerating these doses. The higher you can get the dosing, the most um, benefit the patient will receive. And, and we're looking at trying to reduce the symptoms of heart failure and also trying to keep them out of hospital um, and reducing hospitalizations for heart failure. So the second line agents, once you've got the ACE inhibitor and the beta blockers um, up titrated is um, aldosterone antagonist, um, such as aldosterone. Um, again, increasing the doses to the maximum tolerated doses and checking um, renal function and um, electrolytes at regular intervals. These are the main, this is the mainstay therapies for heart failure. And NICE says that patients with heart failure due to left ventricular dis systolic dysfunction are offered ACE inhibitors or ARBs um, and beta blockers and increase to optimal tolerated or target doses with monitoring after each dose increase. Some of the things that may affect um, increasing the doses in our patients are um, some of the side effects that you might see. So if a patient's really complaining of dizziness um, and a falls risk, you might not want to go to um, high with the dosing. Um, worsening renal function um, and some ACE inhibitors can cause a dry cough that really does affect the patient's quality of life and affects their sleep. So you might want to look at changing medicine in that situation. And beta blockers again can cause hypotension, bradycardia. Patients can initially feel very tired, especially when you're up titrating the dosing. Um, and there can be side effects that patients may complain about and may affect their quality of life. 
With renal monitoring for ACE inhibitors, we actually can see quite large rises in creatinine for these medicines. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to stop the medicines, but it might mean that you just need to keep at that dose for a bit longer. Um, so just keeping an eye on creatinine and potassium, and there's lots of guidance on um, on targets for these um, in the European um, heart failure guidance. Some of the things that you might, the benefits you may see with these medicines are beta blockers, obviously in reducing the risk of um, um, poor outcomes with heart failure. And then you add in the ACE inhibitor and you get an even greater reduction in the risk. Um, and there's defibrillators, there's um, support and education for the patient. Um, anticoagulation in some cases, and then there's the resynchronization therapy as well. So all these different treatments can affect and reduce the patient's risk of a poor outcome with their heart failure. So some of the points to consider in our patients um, are the medicines and doses that are prescribed suitable. Um, is there anything that we should worry about when we're increasing these medicines? Um, anything that concerns the patient? What are the priorities for the patient? He really wants to be able to play golf. That's something that he really enjoys. And what further assessments and investigations do we need to schedule in? Um, and how often should we be seeing our patient? So another question for you. Um, following um, the optimization of his ACE inhibitor and his beta blocker, what could be our next steps? Should we add in spironolactone? Should we add in dapagliflozin? Should we add in both? Should we change the ACE inhibitor to Sacubitril Valsartan, or do we not need to take any action at all? Let's just um, start the countdown. Oh, we've got an option. Yeah, brilliant. We've got some answers. Thank you. Got three answers. Five answers. Any more? Right, I'll close the voting. So um, we have um, two people saying add in spinalactone, um, nobody adding in dapagliflozin, two people wants to, want to add in both, um, and one person would like to change the ACE inhibitor to to Sarcubitril or Valsartan, and nobody said no action, which is brilliant. So thank you. They're, they are all really good options in this patient. So we're going to discuss that now. So adding in spironolactone to somebody who has their ACE inhibitor and their beta blocker um, maximized and, and well tolerated, um, there is a real benefit in um, reducing uh, mortality. And this has been shown in, in uh, various studies. And we have been using spironolactone in, in um, heart failure patients for a while now. So when we when we chat to our patient, we decide to start spironolactone. Um, we discuss how it improves his prognosis and hopefully will help with his symptoms. When you start spironolactone, it's really important to check potassium levels um, and renal function um, because potassium can go up quite high with this medicine. Um, the other things to think about are his beta blocker dosing, his ACE inhibitor dosing, and his blood pressure control. And it may be that he's um, currently taking a lot of pain for his blood pressure control, but it might be that we can review that now we're increasing the other medicines. Um, and if he still has symptoms after starting spinalactone, it might be that he's um, suitable for dapagliflozin or sacubitril valsartan treatment. So in, after a month, we see him again, and um, we've increased his ACE inhibitor dose, we've increased his beta blocker, and he's on spinalactone, and he's on a good dose of that now. His blood pressure is now fairly well controlled. His heart rate is regular. Um, his renal function is good. Potassium has climbed slightly, but it's still OK. His five is OK. Um, but we need to keep an eye on that to make sure it doesn't go much higher. He's less short of breath, but still struggling to complete the golf course. And that's something that's really important to him. So we need to try and look at that if we can. We're going to stop his amlodipine and we're going to start dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams each day. Now, this is something that we really need to discuss with the patients. This is a this is a new medicine um, that has only recently been um, approved by NICE for use in this country. And it needs to be started in patients who have 
been started on the maximum tolerated dosing of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers and their aldosterone antagonists. And once that treatment is optimised, then we can add in dapagliflozin. Um, dapagliflozin is, um, has been traditionally used in patients with diabetes and now it has shown um, efficiency in patients with heart failure. So, NICE has approved dapagliflozin, as I said, with the other medicines. Um, and it is started now on the advice of a specialist. So it may be that um, the cardiologist may be asking for it to be initiated in primary care, but at the moment in South East London, it's being started in the hospitals. And then after the first month, it's being transferred over to primary care. So how does it work? So as I said, it's traditionally been used in diabetes. It in increases the um, removal of glucose in the urine. Um, so this is how it works. Um, and in patients with um, heart failure, um, the evidence that was presented at the cardiovascular conferences was so overwhelming that there was a standing ovation at the conference because of this um, benefit in um, reduced um, poor outcomes, reduced hospitalisation. And so you can see that um, adding dapagliflozin into this current treatment is, is, is having a real difference on um, heart failure. And in the trials, um, it, was you, it was started in patients with diabetes and patients without diabetes. And similar benefits were shown in patients with and without diabetes. When you're thinking about starting dapagliflozin or any of the SGLT2 inhibitors, which is the family of drugs um, dapagliflozin is from, you need to think about the benefits and risks of therapy. So um, in patients with diabetes, um, it's a great way of controlling the HbA1c, great way of controlling blood sugar. It can encourage weight loss. So if somebody has high BMI, it's very useful in reducing their cardiovascular risk. It can also have an effect on blood pressure. In the studies, it can reduce your um, systolic by about two to three millimetres of mercury, um, and it can reduce your cardiovascular risk, need for hospitali hospitalisation, and more recently um, has been shown to protect the kidneys. Some of the risks in, it, in its use is because you're removing glucose in the urine, you are more at risk of urinary infections, um, fungal infections, um, and there is also this worrying instance of DKA with these medicines, which is well talked about in um, any counselling that you do with your patient, talking about the risks, talking about some of the signs and symptoms of DKA to be concerned about. Um, there have been some um, increased risks of um, foot amputations and fractures, but not this has not really been seen with dapagliflozin. Um, it can... Um, precipitate AKIs, so we need to be keeping an eye on that. Um, and dapagliflozin is not licensed in patients with heart failure if the renal function is below 30. So some of the things to consider in our patient, whether dapagliflozin is useful. So the patient that we're talking about does have um, diabetes. Um, for patients who don't have diabetes, it's really important that we don't confuse them and we don't let them think that they have diabetes because they're taking a medicine that has traditionally been used for diabetes. So it's really important that in the primary care records and in all the literature that we give to the patients, this is not something that is confusing for them. We need to make sure we're seeing these patients every three to six months initially um, just to check um, blood pressure, renal function um, and HbA1c. So with the blood pressure, that can be checked before we start the drug and then within the first three to six months. And you may, may see a lowering in the blood pressure. The renal function um, is checked at initiation just to make sure that it is above 30. And then what often happens in these patients is it does decline within the first month. This is the way the drug, um, the action of the drug. So it's nothing to be too concerned about. And that's why we're saying perhaps check it at three months when this is this is stabilised and then keep checking it every month, every year. The cardiologists who are starting these medicines are checking the HbA1c. The reason for this in somebody who doesn't have diabetes is 
because in the studies they did and what you may find you may actually uncover or find somebody that has diabetes that has that didn't know about it before and it's just to make sure that, that we don't have a risk of DKA in our patients. It's then checked again at three months. At initiation they're also checking liver function so Liver function is checked because this may affect the dosing and in patients with um, severe liver function, you might want to reduce the dose just at initiation, but then it can increase again to 10 milligrams. Patient counselling and encouraging adherence is really important and a knowledge of the side effects of the medicine, but also the symptoms of worsening heart failure are also really important to discuss with your patient. Knowing the signs and symptoms of DKA, this is extremely rare, but it's something that can happen and it does cause hospitalisation. So it's really important that our patients are aware of this. And there's MHRA guidance on this, and there's also South East London guidance on the prescribing of dapagliflozin. The other option for this patient could be to change their ACE inhibitor to sacubitril valsartan. And this is recommended um, for patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction of 35% or less. Um, and what tends to happen is these patients are seen by a specialist who um, stops the ACE inhibitor um, for a period of a few days and then starts the sacubitril valsartan, um, increases the dose. And when the patient is stable on the maximum tolerated dose, then they will be transferred to primary care. Again, there's great evidence for Entresto in um, reducing hospitalisation for heart failure and improving outcomes. Some things to think about with sacubitril valsartan are blood pressure again, renal function, um, and making sure that ACE inhibitor is stopped and making sure it's removed from the patient's medication record. There is also this angioedema risk. It's extremely rare, um, but it is something to be aware of um, in patients on sacubitril valsartan. So in summary, um, we can help our heart failure patients by reducing the risk of them having to go to hospital. And this is really by um, monitoring their symptoms, making sure they're not having any symptoms of worsening heart failure, looking out for red flags, monitoring the adverse effects of their medicines, making sure there's nothing that we're adding into their prescription that may affect their heart failure or the medicines they're taking for their heart failure keeping an eye on their electrolytes, keeping an eye on their renal function, and making sure that we maximise as much as we can the medicines that will improve their prognosis with heart failure. And NICE does recommend that our heart failure patients are seen every six months, um, but realistically, um, 12 monthly reviews are recommended for these patients. So that was the heart failure patients. Do we have any questions at all? Sorry, I can't see anybody. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm monitoring. That was clearly extremely comprehensive, Rachel. <laughs> oh, good. That's good. OK. Uh, so someone did. Oh, yes. Um, so, so, Rab, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'm just interested to know if the algorithms for a heart failure in preserved ejection fraction are different for heart failure in reduced ejection fraction. I know there's a lot of debate uh, in, the, uh, in the medical press about that. Can you say a little bit about the difference in the algorithms? Yes, thank you. That's a very important um, comment, actually, because the, um, at the moment we don't really have much in the way of progno prognostic treatments for preserved ejection fraction. Um, there is emerging evidence, actually, for the SGLT2 inhibitors in preserved ejection fraction, but the mainstay of treatment at the moment is with diuretics. Um, so I guess my answer is watch this space. Um, but um, yes, it's definitely an emerging area at the moment. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Helen. So should we move on to AF? Yes, let's go. OK, <laughs> is everyone still with me? <laughs> Um, so the next patient is Peter and he is 66 years old, he has hypertension and he has type 2 diabetes. He currently takes amlodipine and metformin. 
And his blood pressure in clinic is 135 over 85, which coincidentally is the target we're looking for in home blood pressure monitoring. Um, his weight is 70. Um, but what we find when we check his blood pressure is that he has an irregular pulse and the heart rate is 78 beats per minute. When we do an ECG, it confirms atrial fibrillation. So I just wanted to discuss with you what we should be doing next in this patient. So in the new NICE guidance for atrial fibrillation, it definitely focuses on anticoagulation and rate or rhythm control. So they are the things I'm going to talk about now. A uh, question for you all, please. Um, what should you check before starting anticoagulation? And this is really a free text. Just add some comments um, about what sort of things you might check before you start anticoagulation in your patient. I don't have any comments yet. Maybe I hadn't opened voting. Now I can see some comments. We've got symptoms, cresting clearance. Any more? Renal function, Chad's vast, brilliant. Okay. So um, yeah, that's brilliant. That's that's the sort of thing that we're thinking about. So. Some of the things to check before starting anticoagulation, the CHADS VASC score. So this is your risk of um, having a stroke with the atrial fibrillation. Has bled or orbit score. So the has bled score is in GP systems as a way of working out bleeding risk. But um, NICE guidance is now recommending the orbit score, which we currently don't have embedded in GP systems, but um, you can use this online if you, if you would like to. Um, we need to talk to our patients about what they would like to do. We need to think about their lifestyle. Renal function, as you mentioned, is really important um, because that will um, help us determine which medicine to use and which dose. Uh, we need to know the patient's weight because we need to work out an accurate crusting clearance. Think about interacting medicines. Again, that will affect bleeding risk and also the dosing of the DOAX, potentially. Um, think about um, blood counts. Think about clotting screen potentially just um, before you start the anticoagulation and liver function as well. Um, all of these um, checks um, that are recommended before starting anticoagulation are in the South East London DOAC initiation and monitoring guidance. That is hopefully of use to you. So for Peter, um, his Chad VAS score is three. So his risk of having a stroke each year is 3.2%. Um, his has bled score is one. Um, the reason for this is the has bled score um, takes age over 65, um, but the orbit score in, takes age over 75. So he scores zero for the orbit score, but one for the has bled score. So this gives you a risk of a bleed um, versus the risk of having a stroke. Um, so we just need to talk to Peter about the benefits and risks of anticoagulation. He doesn't want to take warfarin. He doesn't want to have lots of his visits for monitoring. Um, and he has a wife at home who needs care. So he really doesn't want to come into hospital regularly for blood tests. We reassure him that if he has a DOAC, it does require less monitoring. And the NICE AF guidance is now recommending that we do use DOAC's first line in atrial fibrillation where we can. The crossing clearance is 62 mils a minute, and he doesn't take any medicines that may affect um, DOAC prescribing. So he's prescribed adoxaban, 60 milligrams a day. This is our first line DOAC in southeast London for patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, he's counselled and he's referred to his community pharmacy because um, with the new medicine service, the community pharmacist can really help support patient adherence and support understanding of medicines.
It's really important also that the patient is coded as atrial fibrillation on the primary care systems. So question for you, um, when should Peter have his next renal function check in primary care? So we've started the DOAC and when should we check his renal function again? Is it that one month, six months, 12 months or two years? I think I've opened voting, but I might not have done. Oh, we've got an answer. That's brilliant. OK, we've got five answers in. That's brilliant. Thank you. Six answers. So we've got four people saying um, one month at the moment. We've got one person saying six months and one saying 12 months. Um, and nobody's saying two years. So that's brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, so. It's an interesting question because with Edoxaban in somebody who has a cresting clearance of over 60, the um, frequency of monitoring that is recommended for um, renal function is every 12 months, so an annual check. And this comes from the renal function guidance that we have in South East London for our direct patients. Um, and it also comes from the European um, guidance. Um, for patients who are particularly elderly or frail, um, you may want to check this six monthly. Um, but yeah, as a, as a golden rule, every, every 12 months and um, for somebody with a good renal function. Um, what is useful, though, in a patient who's newly started on a DOAC is to see them again in a month um, and just check how they're getting on with everything. So we'll just talk about that um, as well um, a bit later. But um, another thing to check annually for DOAC patients, have a think about what, um, what you might also check each year in a patient taking a DOAC. So just add some text, if you can, to um, the Mentimeter. Rachel, there's also been a question. Why a doxaban as first line and not a pixaban? <laughs> um, I might answer that at the end of the presentation if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, so we have um, four blood counts, we have LFT, we have pecking for bruising, brilliant. Um, recheck has blood and Chadvask, um, checking your weight. Checking crescent clearance. So four blood counts, LFTs, use and ease, adherence. Bleeding, I think, is what's that supposed to say? Any more? Right, I'll close, I'll close that. That's brilliant. So um, in the direct initiation and monitoring templates that we have in South East London, we have um, within the first month of therapy, so if the DOAC is started by the hospital and the patient comes to primary care for a follow up, these are the sort of things to look out for. So is the patient tolerating therapy, any bruising or bleeding, as you as you mentioned, checking for any side effects, checking um, if indicated, checking a crusting clearance, checking a blood count if you're worried about something. Um, checking that they're taking the medicines, checking they may have been to their community pharmacy for some more support and then it's really useful when you have that first prescription from the hospital to schedule their repeat prescriptions and and schedule the reviews so with this patient making sure that there is a review at the, at the year and then at least every year is checking a weight so you can and just serum creatinine so you can um, calculate an accurate creatinine clearance checking um, if there's any effect on the platelets anything um, going on with the hemoglobin is there any effect on the liver? Um, and if the creatinine clearance has changed from baseline, you might need to adjust the dose. So just have a check and make sure there's nothing that may affect the dosing of the DOAC. Checking if anything new has been prescribed that may affect the bleeding risk or interact with the medicines. And of course, if you ever need any help or support with any of this, um, the antiquary teams are very helpful um, locally. 
So um, the question was, why not a doxaban? So um, in southeast London, um, we have decided our first line agents for atrial fibrillation and um, VTE are a doxaban or rivaroxaban. There are various reasons for this, um, but in terms of patient um, tolerability, it's just a once daily dose. And so a doxaban is 60 milligrams a day and rivaroxaban is 20 milligrams a day. Um, and reasons that you may want to adjust the dose would be crossing clearance, um, weight um, and interacting medications. So for Peter, we um, need to also think about, we've anticoagulated him, he's very happy. Um, should we give some rate or rhythm control for his atrial fibrillation? So Peter's pulse rate is 78, um, but he doesn't really complain of any symptoms. He's not saying he's dizzy or any of those symptoms of AF. So we don't really need to worry so much about rate control at this stage. If you were going to start rate control, you're aiming for a heart rate of 90 to 110 beats per minute at rest um, with a beta blocker or a rate limiting calcium channel blocker. Um, but it does depend on the patient's symptoms and what they would like to do, anything else going on with their comorbidities. When you're thinking about rhythm control, some patients may be suitable for rhythm control. So this would be with medicines or um, cardioversions um, and ablations which would need specialist input. Amiodrone is very rarely used nowadays, um, but it is always started now by a specialist. And often it's only prescribed for a short term around the um, ablation or the cardioversion, or sometimes it's used after they've had cardiac surgery. So you might only see it um, for up to 12 months after cardioversion, three months after an ablation and only for six weeks after surgery. And we know that we have a lot of patients in primary care who are on amiodarone currently and, and, and potentially could be reviewed. Um, but for new patients, this, this is what we are currently um, looking at in South East London. So um, just some, there's a lot of guidance out there on DOAC prescribing um, that we have in South East London on the APC website. Um, and there's also patient pathways as well to support um, secondary care to primary care transfers. There's also um, the South London Cardiac Network AF pathway for um, new diagnoses. And there's also the new um, NICE guidance for atrial fibrillation that you may find useful. Are there any questions, any further questions, Sally Ann at all? I can't see any, but if anyone would like to ask any questions, now is your opportunity. OK, I'll move on because we don't have long now. So in the last 15 minutes, I'm just going to talk about um, ACS if you're still with me. So the case study three is a lady called Doris and she is 56 um, and she has an African Caribbean um, background. She has um, recently been discharged from hospital following a non-ST elevation MI, and she's had a PCI, a drug looting stent to her left anterior descending artery. So a big artery that leads, uh, that um, provides oxygenated blood to the left ventricle. Her left ventricular ejection fraction is 60%. So she's actually got quite a good um, uh, function there. Um, she's a smoker and she is overweight, so we do need to think about that um, and lifestyle um, interventions. Her total cholesterol when she came into hospital was 5.8. Her HDR was 0.9, so the total cholesterol could be lower, the HDR could be higher. And what we do with cholesterols now is we check a baseline and we're looking at non-HDL cholesterol for our patients. And to calculate non-HDL, it's the total cholesterol with the HDR removed. So that gives us a value of 4.9 for this patient. So that could be lower. Her renal function is good. Her blood pressure is on the high side. Um, and this may have been another contributing factor to her um, ACS episode, but her heart rate is regular. So she is prescribed when she leaves hospital, aspirin to Cagrilor, Bramipril, Bisoprolol, a torvastatin, a meprazole and a GTN spray. I'm sure you've seen many prescriptions like this. Um, but what I've done there is highlighted the dosing of the ramipril and the bisoprolol. 
because as with heart failure, when a patient's discharged from hospital um, following an ACS, we need to try and increase those doses if we can to the maximum tolerated doses for our patients to have the maximum benefit in reducing their risk of having a further MI. So um, another question for you. When, you, when Doris comes to see you in your surgery, um, what would be your priority on the first view with you? Just um, and enter any ideas you might have. That's a brilliant one. How often do you need to use a GTN? That's really, really useful. And I have to say, sometimes GTNs missed off the prescription, so it's really important that um, they do have their GTN spray. Lifestyle, so yes, um, focusing on um, uh, weight management, perhaps um, increasing exercise. Smoking is a big one for this patient. How are they feeling? How are they feeling psychologically? They've been through um, something huge and um, how are they actually coping with it now they're discharged from hospital. Um, compliance with medicines, yes, that's important. Do, does she understand all of these medicines she's now taking after not taking anything before? Um, looking at side effects of medicines. Um, yeah, they're all really useful um, points. Thank you for those. So some of the some of the things that we've talked about, um, checking her understanding of what's happened to her, what does it mean um, going forwards? and checking mentally and physically how she's feeling, um, thinking about lifestyle, but she has got a few things that she may need to look at, but we probably need to just focus on one thing at a time if we can. The big one for her would be her smoking. Um, talking about medicines, what are they all for? How does she take them? Um, talking about how she can reduce her risk of having a further ACS. And one of the big things that we can encourage in our patients is cardiac rehab. The cardiac rehab services are so helpful, um, but unfortunately, uptake to these services is very low. We, we need to help her with her priorities and her goals um, and, and signpost her to all the support networks that are out there to help her understand what's happened and how she can reduce her risk going forwards. And also, she may need some blood tests, which I know are very difficult at the moment without tubes, but she may need to have some reviews. So the ACS um, guidance um, has been updated by NICE recently, and there are some great pathways um, are for, for ST elevation MIs, non-ST elevation MIs, and for secondary prevention. This pathway shows you about the cardiac rehab side um, and lifestyle changes and the drug therapy that is prescribed for secondary prevention and some other ways that we can increase the dosing um, as tolerated. And also talks about antiplatelets um, and the indication for aldosterone antagonists if patients have um, any heart failure following their MI. So in terms of cholesterol management, do you know following an ACS episode what treatment target we are aiming for with lipids? We've got one, one answer so far, two answers, three, any more, five, six. So um, I'll close the voting now. So most people are saying um, total cholesterol less than four, LDL less than two, or a 40% reduction in non-HDL cholesterol. Um, we have actually got a series of lipid management webinars across South East London at the moment. We have two more um, that um, please come and attend if you can, where we talk about lipid management in general in primary prevention, secondary prevention. Um, and what we are aiming for in patients with ACS is a 40% lowering of non-HDL cholesterol from the baseline. Um, and that is why it's so important that hospitals communicate to primary care what's that baseline non-HDL cholesterol is so that you can monitor therapy and make sure it's working.
So for medicines optimization post monastery elevation MI, um, something that we need to look at in primary care is how we review the antiplatelets at one year. So when the patients have their PCIs, they will be prescribed aspirin with another antiplatelet um, and the cardiologists will let you know what should happen at that year um, generally. But some patients after that first year of therapy will then go on to a lower dose of one of the antiplatelets or they will stop one of the antiplatelets, um, which I will talk about um, shortly. But um, the other thing to look at is the statins. So patients are prescribed high dose, high intensity statins after an ACS. So the high intensity statins are atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. And the high dose is the 80 milligrams of rosuvastatin that you'll be seeing. And the plan is for these patients to take these lifelong, um, but there is a lot of satin hesitancy out there. Patients have heard the bad press about them. They may have had bad experiences before when they have been prescribed a statin. So it's all about supporting the patients to take these statins and keep taking them. And so that's why one of the reasons we check our lipid profiles after the first three months to see is the non-HDL cholesterol coming down, is the patient actually taking the medication? And we also check the LFTs just to see if it's affecting the liver function at all. Um, it is very rare, but it can affect liver function. We also look at the ACE inhibitor. We, we keep these going um, as long as we can, really, as long as they're tolerated. But we need to try and look at increasing the dosing and making sure the renal function, the potassium and the blood pressure is able to tolerate these higher doses. For the beta blocker, the NICE guidance is now saying just to continue for one year unless the patient has heart failure or continuing chest pain. Um, so at the year, we can say, shall we stop the beta blocker if there's no other reason to continue it? Um, and then we'll have to try and reduce the dose gradually over time if we're stopping it. Um, but again, the beta blocker needs to be up titrated according to the patient's tolerance, the, beta, um, the blood pressure and the heart rate and side effects, if they're having any issues with any side effects. Um, we need to manage her hypertension. So she was hypertensive before the um, ACS episode that we didn't know about. So we need to make sure, even though we're increasing her ACE and her beta blocker, are we still managing to control the hypertension? And have we confirmed hypertension with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring? And quite rightly, as you said, we need to check if she's having any chest pain symptoms. Is she using her GTN at all? Does she know how to use a GTN? Um, is the GTN spray in date? Little things like that can make a huge difference in an emergency situation. Um, and so when we're, when we're up titrating medicines, it is a good idea to keep following up these patients every few weeks to months, um, which I know is not always feasible, um, but that is the ideal scenario. So for antiplatelets, what happens at one year? Um, this can be very tricky um, and it is helpful if we have more guidance from the cardiologist. Um, but this isn't always possible. So at one year, the option could be to stop the clopidogrel, the prostogrel, or the tachycardial, and continue aspirin on its own. The other option at one year could be to change the tachycardial from 90 milligrams BD to a lower dose of 60 milligrams BD for a further three years. And this is if patients are at very high risk of having a further MI. The other option could be to consider a switch to rivaroxaban with um, the aspirin. Um, and this is a newer um, recommendation, um, according to NICE, following the COMPASS study. So for the, for the patients who may be suitable for rivaroxaban, um, the COMPASS study looked at patients aged over 65 who had had an MI in the last 20 years, who had maybe a history of stroke, um, and maybe had um, atherosclerosis in the coronary, vascular or peripheral arteries, but also who had risk factors for a further event, such as they're still smoking, they may be diabetic, they may have renal dysfunction and other factors. It also looked at patients who had um, peripheral vascular, vascular disease um, um, and symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. And NICE recommended its use um, because of the benefits in reducing cardiovascular events. Um, 
So that's why the recommendation came for duroxaban low dose with aspirin. Unfortunately, there are also issues with this rec recommendation because it does increase the risk of bleeding, especially gastrointestinal bleeding. So in the study, patients were excluded if they had a high bleeding risk, if they had a recent stroke in the last month, um, if they have kidney disease, if they are taking dual antiplatelets, etc. So when you're thinking about this therapy in your patient, um, you need to think about risk versus benefits. So is the risk of bleeding outweighing the, the benefits in this situation? So there are various patients who it may be suitable for and patients where it may not be suitable for. At the moment in South East London, we're really only seeing this medicine being used in patients with peripheral artery disease. And this is used by use in vascular surgery. So the second option is if somebody's taking ticagrelor with the aspirin for the first year following their PCI is to continue the ticagrelor to lower dose. And this comes from the Pegasus study. And the criteria in the study for continuing the ticagrelor to lower dose was um, because of the following features. If they had diabetes requiring medication, if they had renal dysfunction, if they were elderly, if they had multivessel disease, and if they had previously had an MI. In these um, patients, they continued the, the decagrilor for up to three years. And this is where the recommendation from NICE comes for this therapy. So, yes, it's important to look at the antiplatelets at one year. Um, and it's also important to think about what should happen for the next following years. But one big issue we have is stopping antiplatelets early. Um, we know that the risk of a second MI within the first year is high. Um, but if you stop the antiplatelets early, you have there is a risk of um, of rethrombosing um, the stent and causing further MIs. So we need to be really careful um, when we're stopping our antiplatelets. There's some great guidance from um, UCL partners on um, using anticoagulants with antiplatelets. Um, and in fact, in primary care, um, lots of patients who are currently prescribed anticoagulation with antiplatelets um, have been reviewed um, and gastro protection has been prescribed in these patients. So we are already very aware of this. Um, and this table just summarizes some of the options that are available when you're reviewing um, antiplatelets. So I think you will know about gastro protection, but it is something to consider when you have a patient on dual antiplatelets or antiplatelets with anticoagulants. And beta blockers, so there is lots of evidence of beta blockers. So yes, increase the dosing and then review at 12 months. ACE inhibitors, lots of evidence for their use. Increase the dose as, as much as you can. Left ventricular function, so Doris, um, she actually has a good left ventricular function. Um, so patients who have signs of heart failure following their MI may be started on spironolactone or eplerinone. This is generally within the first 12, of, within the first 14 days um, of the ACS episode. And this comes from the Ephesus study, which showed um, reduced mortality post MI in patients with um, signs and symptoms of heart failure. So one last question for you that I hope I've just answered. Um, does Doris require an aldosterone antagonist? You've got about one minute left, Rachel. Thank you, thank you. Anyone, anyone answering that question? Oh, yep, we do have one. Very good. So yeah, I'll just close that voting now. So we've got one answer, depends on left ventricular function. So yes, it depends. Depends how long it was since the MI. Um, it depends on the left ventricular function. And no, she doesn't need it in this case. So just to summarise, um, multiple therapies are required to optimise outcomes in cardiovascular disease. Um, we need to optimise the dosing when patients are discharged from hospital. We need to think about monitoring these therapies as well and managing both the symptoms and the cardiovascular risk. Um, patient understanding is key to this. Um, and 
they should be tailored to each individual, um, to their lifestyle um, and to improve adherence. And adverse effects and red flags should be dealt with really quickly. So I uh, just any further questions in the last minute? I'll, I'll close this now so I can see you. So there is a question in the chat, um, Rachel. What are the risks from brief cessation of DAP, DAPT, e.g. for operations? Yes, um, that's a good question. And I would always make sure that that has been um, kind of consulted with the surgeon um, and potentially a cardiologist, because it depends how long after the ACS episode the surgery is. So if somebody's had... It say in the last three months had a drug eating stent, I'd be really worried about surgery. Um, and even within that first year, um, but it's all it would always be discussion with the relative um, consultants looking after that patient. I would, yeah, I would be quite worried about stopping it quite soon after an event. Thank you. Any final questions before we draw the event to a close? Thank you very much, Rachel. Amazing that you did the whole thing without Helen, who was going to be your co-presenter. So thank you very much for that. Um, we will be circulating the link to the recording of this event with the follow up um, email that will also include the CPD certificate. And I'm aware that we've had a couple of people join in the last five minutes. Um, and apologies, there was a mix up over the timing. So this event was running from 12.30 to 1.30 and not 1.30 to 2.30. So apologies to those people who have just joined, but we will be circulating the link to the recording. So I hope that you can catch up with the really informative talk from Rachel um, in, your, um, in, in, in the next few days. So once again, thank you so much, Rachel, and um, we look forward to seeing you all at the next event. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Lots of thanks coming through in the chat.